Good afternoon, everybody. Keith here. Hoping everybody's having a good day, enjoying life, living life, loving life. We're going to hang out for a few minutes, get some people to come on, and uh, hopefully uh, people share this video, because I don't think I'm going to talk about it anymore. It's very succinct, and in plain writing in their own codes. And that's that traffic citation. So please feel free to uh, share the video and get other people on. We're going to hang out. Hoping everybody again is enjoying the day, living life, loving life. As we're meant to. So. I'm hoping everybody's going to pay attention because, like I said, I've, I've discussed this several times. This is uh, the main thing that I've been researching over the last six years because it was the issue that I was having a problem with the most in my life. 93 cases in and out of these courts, and generally it was all for traffic. All for traffic. And so we're not going to discuss the traffic thing anymore. We're going to do this today. And people are just going to learn how to share this video because I'm not going to make another one. It's very, like I said, very plain and concise on the way it's constructed. The requirements that are needed first in order to then carry on with other transactions. So, everything we deal with today is all commerce. When we're dealing with things out in the public, everything is commerce. Commerce is an extension of contracts. And contracts themselves are extensions of trusts. You cannot do anything in commercial activities without trust first. So let's talk first about trust for every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in the word of God. If the contract does not have the word of God in it, it cannot be valid. There is inducement, there's deceit, there's fraud, there's detriment, there's harm, there's injury. And this is why they are required to have insurance. Because it is known to cause harm, damage, and injury. But see, the insurance is the gamble. That's the true game. Everybody's required to have insurance. Excuse me. But before you can set up a contract, there's already supposed to be surety. What is surety? Surety is the asset set aside as collateral in case there's harm, injury, or damage. So why is a, a contract requiring further insurance if the surety is already provided? Well, the insurance goes to the words of the contract. Because though you may have a thing set aside as surety, you have to make sure that your words are true in accordance with the relevation or re relation to that asset. So I can call that nice looking automobile outside in the driveway where it's parked by one thing, but if I present it as something else, it doesn't matter if I'm doing it intentionally or without knowing. Either way, it causes harm, injury, or damage. Because if I do it intentfully, then that's evil and very deceitful. If I do it without knowing, then who is the true surety? What is the surety in that contract? That's why you're required to have insurance because you don't know. And if you buy the insurance, it proves you don't know what you're doing in contracts. Senate Document 43. The History of Money Banking Contracts Payable in Gold. 
So, oops, let me see here, I did something wrong there, there we go, exactly John, what contract, see it's not a contract until it's finalized, and until the surety situation is resolved, and people identify the actual surety as the assets, which are the things set aside as collateral for the harm, injury, or damage. Proving that they're incompetent is the purchase of the insurance when there should be a surety already identified. This is how they catch you not knowing is when you step up to the plate and acquiesce to reason and logic that most people think is reason and logic because they keep believing instead of doing their own research. People don't realize how hard it is to speak the truth to a world full of people that didn't realize they're living a lie. This is so true. So, so true. So, let's take a look here. And again, you know me people, I love showing my sources. And my source here today in regards to this the oath being a requirement in order to even be required to then have a driver license to even then be subject to being issued a traffic citation. And if we look here, we're looking at 26 U.S. Code 7701, which is the tax code. Because everything is for federal tax purposes. Okay? However, the concept of federal tax purposes itself, people. Just like John says, the idea of a contract is another lie. The concept of federal tax purposes is to a lie. How do we know this? Because there is a substantial element called a doctrine of law that says government instrumentalities are not taxable. So the federal income tax purposes is inconsistent with the very doctrines of law they pose that these contracts are following. Think about this, people. And let me show you the source. My apologies. Fumble fingered here. We're looking at Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. And we're going to look for, um, let's see here, what is it? Um, There we go. Look at that. Let me blow it up so everybody can read this. Because like I said, it is a doctrine. Now the doctrines of law are the found basic foundations of law. They are the basic foundations of law itself. And it says... Government instrumentality doctrine. The doctrine that government instrumentalities are tax exempt. Okay? Now remember what I talked about the foundation of law. This is a government doctrine. And it starts out with D-O. Do. You do his good works. The dominion exercised over the estate of deceased, full 
blood restricted Creek Indian would not vest in the government of a, a government a control sufficient to exempt the estate from estate taxes under the government instrumentality doctrine. Why? Why would they say that the Creek Indian is not subject to the exemption of the state from estate taxes? Because it's a title. Creek Indian is a title that the government gave to those people. It is not what they called themselves. It is not what he called us. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Ye are mine. That is the private estate. I am his property. I am not delegating the distribution of somebody else's property and calling it mine. I am freely giving what he freely gave to his property himself. Let's not misconstrue that doctrine. Okay, so let's go back to 26 U.S.C. 7701. Their code. Okay, when their code is expressing a motor vehicle operator's lease. Let's, let's go back to this side. Because before we get into this, I want to talk about where they get all of their, their transportation codes. Because their transportation codes, whether they want to call it transit, traffic, transportation, um, trade, commerce, whatever. It is the move, movement, the motion from point A to point B. Proverbs 121 verse 8. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. That's very concise. It's plain writing. And it is an ancient document that is more prolifically published than any other document in the history of mankind known as the Scriptures. Not the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, but religious or spiritual scriptures, which are the King James Version of the Bible, um, previous Bibles, the, Cor uh, the Koran, the, the Torah, various different scriptures from, out, from throughout the world. They all agree the same thing. No man has a right to restrict your movements. None. So, when we look at this code, Title 26 of the U.S. Code, 7701, and we go down to Section H. Now, if you look on the side of the, the sidebar here, and you see this little thing right here, see it moving? You're going to go down about three quarters of the page, right about here. And there it is. Section H. Motor vehicle operating leases. Now a lease is the same thing as a rental agreement or any other simpler contract. Okay? And notice, again, one of my favorite terms in general. That's military people. It is, in fact, a military term. For purposes of this title, tax purposes. So for the instrumentality of a government, tax purpose, which is inconsistent on its face, the purposes of this title, this title being the tax code. So if it's a tax code in the federal codes known as the United States Code, how 
Can they implement it? How can they instrumentalize it? They can't unless various elements are had. They have to be done. The very first one must be an oath of office, which we will talk about here in a little bit. So it says, in the case of a qualified motor vehicle operating agreement. Now they just changed two things. <coughs> now they they went from a motor vehicle operating leases to agreement, and now they added qualified. So what is qualified? Well, we're going to find out. With su which contains a terminal rental adjustment clause. This is a contract clause, and that clause is going to be noted down here in one of these definitions. It's going to be a clause. It's known as a clause in the code, which is actually a contract. This here is a contract itself, and the clause is going to be located lower in this definition. Such agreement shall be treated, treated as a lease. Now, treating something as a lease is treating something as a contract which is not enforceable. Contracts, people, get it through your heads, are not enforceable. The trust is enforceable, not the contract. The contract has to be conscionable. It must have equal consideration, equal benefit, and if detriment is, it must be shared equally amongst all parties. Coming upon detriment in a contract is an automatic estoppel to the contract for arbitration to resolve the detriment. It is not to claim somebody did you wrong and is causing harm, injury, or damage, or fraud, or anything. It is a point in time to come to peace with terms and conditions. If such agreement would be treated as a lease under this title and, so it's got to be and, it's this and this, and then he says in parentheses, but for such terminal rental adjustment clause. So what it's saying is there's an exception. You have to go to the terminal rental adjustment clause. And again, I'll show you that. So then it says, and, so it has the, this, and the lessee shall not be treated as the owner of the property. Subject to an agreement, during any period such agreement is in effect. Okay, the lessee shall not be treated as owner of the property subject to the agreement. The qualified motor vehicle operating agreement defined. For purposes of this section, again, they put in general. The term qualified motor vehicle operating agreement means any agreement with respect to a motor vehicle including a trailer, which meets the requirements of subparagraphs B, C, and D of this paragraph. So it's not including this stuff up here. This stuff up here is merely mentioning the Terminal Rental Adjustment Clause and where it applies. So, minimum liability of lesser Who's the lesser? An agreement meets the requirements of this subparagraph if under such agreement the sum of the amount the lesser is personally liable to repay and the net fair market value of the lesser's interest in any property pledged as security for property subject to the agreement. Where does this pledge come in. The property pledged is the registration of an automobile. 
and they specifically state this in plain writing in all of your state codes, when they say automobile registration, and they don't yet use the term motor vehicle, look in your codes, and they will say automobile registration is where the starting point is. And once you register it as an automobile under the pledge, you're supposed to qualify that pledge. This is the Terminal Rental Adjustment Clause we're going to be looking at. Equals or exceeds all amounts. This is just all bullshit. It's pertaining to the property subject to the agreement, which is the property pledge, which is the automobile, which is now defined as a motor vehicle due to this pledge equals or exceeds all amounts borrowed to finance the acquisition of property subject to the, the agreement. Finance the acquisition of property subject to the agreement. So, there's an acquisition of the property that took place equals or exceeds all amounts borrowed to finance. The acquisition of the property. Who acquisitioned the property first? The automobile manufactured it. Dealerships acquired it first. They borrowed the money from the United States to acquire it first. You went to the lot to acquire it second. But in the first acquisition by the dealership, the MCO was handed over to the state for this part here only. The, the amounts borrowed to finance the original acquisition, the first acquisition of property subject to the agreement which was imported into the United States. It is an import acquisition. There shall not be taken into account under Clause 2 any property pledged which is property subject to the agreement or property directly or indirectly financed by indebtedness secured by property subject to the agreement. See, when the automobile dealership borrowed money from the United States to acquisition the the automobile, and then sold it to somebody else, the United States now carries the indebtedness because they're the ones that hold that MCO. So regardless of where you bought the car from, under that import, unless you make a custom order direct manufacturer to have it privately shipped you are involved in this original indebtedness and you're paying off the United States who has an obligation already and who has already failed that obligation because the borrower, the dealership, didn't know this information first. This is the problem. If they are the lessor, certification by lessee and notice of tax ownership. Now, if you're saying that you don't own the property, that you pledged it to the state, and you now become the lessee through a rental agreement, you have to make the certification. You're the one that is supposed to make the certif certi certification. The, the state holds the title and they give you a certificate of title and you're supposed to certify it. How do you certify it? You have to make a specific statement yourself and then sign it in wet ink to certify that certificate of title that the state holds and that the lease that you are operating under with the, the intent to perform at least 
50% of the use of that motor vehicle to the performance of functions of public office. If you don't make that, that qualifying statement, this lease is not qualified. You are the one that has to qualify it. If you don't qualify it specifically with that statement, then the certification is false. It has never been finalized. Period. We're going to continue on and show you the proof of this. Certification by lessee. Notice of tax ownership. So what you did was you, you, you gave up ownership of the property pledged to the state. Now the state owns the automobile because they are holder of a certificate of title and they're waiting for you to certify it. And in so doing, you have to give them notice of tax ownership. An agreement meets the requirement of this subparagraph if such agreement contains a separate written statement separately signed by the lessee before we go any further people does anybody remember doing this does anybody ever remember going to the county and filling out the registration and paying for it yourself and then writing up a separate statement signing it by yourself for any reason or did you just stop at the registration and go directly to getting insurance and a driver license and never qualifying the registration whereby you pledge the automobile as surety and then took insurance claiming yourself as surety as well because you never gave a certifying statement relieving you of the requirement of insurance or a driver's license or the requirement to make a pledge that is incompetent because you have no oath of office to perform the functions of office for which you could then pledge the property for its use in that office. If you don't understand what I just said, it is plain, concise English, and you can rewind it, this video, as many times as you want. It will be in my files, and I will repost it as many times as I need to if anybody tries to remove it without properly showing and proving that I am in fact wrong in these statements. And if they do, then I will repent and make a new video admitting my error. I challenge everyone for the concise English placed in, on, and for the public domain as it is already recorded. So if they rebut what I am saying, I would expect that this code be changed as well for the very wording that I am using that they put forth in this code. So, if you did not sign a separate statement that you made yourself under penalty of perjury, under which the lessee certifies under penalty of perjury, your intent that more than 50% of the use of the property subject to the agreement, which is the automobile, now known as a motor vehicle, is to be used in a trade or business of the lessee. What is trade or business folks coming from the same code 7701 no he does not A26 this is section A26 and it says trade or business trade or business the term trade or business includes which means it excludes all else the performance of the functions of a public office. 
pure and simple. I am not in public office. I am, just like John says, I am not in the jurisdiction. Period. Can't be had. Cannot. It is impossible. It is an impossibility. That fake attorney, lying bastard, standing there telling the court he has personal jurisdiction. He cannot possibly have it. I have never given certification to be in personal capacity of, a, of performing the functions of public office, which clearly and legibly states that the lessee has been advised that it will not be treated as the owner of the property subject to the agreement. Again, did anybody know that they were going to be buying a car and then pledging it Without any compensation in return. That's what a pledge is. It's a donation. So you're going to donate something you buy so that you can take on a tax ownership to implement the government services that aren't taxable. And you're going to do so without taking an oath of office to perform the functions of public office first and foremost so that then you can implement the taxes, so then you can form a contract, so then you can move in commerce. I find it very inconsistent. And I would highly expect, again, if anybody of all the billions of people on this planet can figure out a way to rebut what I am stating. That's how firm I am on it. In this writing, they tell you you have to first have an oath of office in order to even register an automobile. Period. Plain writing. Next one. Just like it started out. <laughs> property subject to the agreement for federal income tax purposes. For purposes of this title, which is the tax title, and then under, under this one where they say subject to A, B, C, or B, C, and D, which is the following three, and they end it with, for federal income tax purposes on this one. And then D says lessor must have no knowledge that certification is false. Let me ask you folks, if they never reserved the, the certification verifying that it's true. My apologies. So if they haven't first acquired the handwritten statement verifying that the certification is true, they can only operate on the presumption that it's true. And therefore, they never have knowledge that it is true. And therefore, you must give them knowledge that it is false. Otherwise, they will remain on the presumption that it is true. That's how they operate. Pure and simple. So as we finish reading this, <coughs> an agreement meets the requirements of this subparagraph if the lesser does not know that the certification described in subparagraph CI is false. So let's go up to CI, under which the lessee certifies under penalty. They're telling you right there it's false because they know you haven't given them one. They don't have any on record. Find one. Anybody? Has anybody filled one of these? Has anyone handwritten a statement and then signed it, pledging their automobile? I don't think so. So once we give them notice, your first duty in law is legal notice. So we give them legal notice, the lessor. I am supposedly presumed to be the lessee. I must give them notice that... They, it, the certification is false. I can't certify the use of an automobile for motor vehicle for motor vehicle purposes because I have not taken an oath 
of office so that I can make the qualifying statement of my intent to perform the functions of public office. I am not liable to the people in that capacity yet. I am incompetent. Not competent to qualify that status. Period. Terminal Rental Adjustment Clause defined for purposes of this section, this subsection, the term rental means a provision of an agreement which permits or requires the rental price to be adjusted upward or downward by reference to the amount realized by the lesser under the agreement upon sale or other disposition of such property. So, when you buy the nice automobile from the manufacturer or the, or the dealership, you have to give the state notice that you're not qualified for the performance of the functions of public office. Therefore, you can't be required to register the motor vehicle as a pledge. Therefore, they have to remove the title or issue you the title. One or the other. Cannot be both. They cannot say that they hold title to a commercial motor vehicle that can't be implemented as a commercial motor vehicle. It has to be by use. The, the, the thing used is defined by its use. Now, if I want to buy a boat... And I want to plant it in my front yard and fill it full of dirt and use it as a planter bed. It is no longer a boat. Get it? It does not qualify to be used as a boat unless I further perform certain conductive activities and then inspect it again. These are very simple things we need to start doing, people. And like I said, no one should have a problem with the traffic citation ever. I'm sorry, officer. I'm sorry that you, you feel that I'm making a mistake by not traveling with license plates. But let me show you your mutual mistake in your training and understanding and all of the education everyone's ever given any of you police officers to pull somebody over that is displaying private property in plain language, and you use your own discretion by referring to a record that says the identification has been made and is on and for the record, but nobody can prove that there's an oath to that identification. You guys see what that means? Now we've just taken it from traffic court to divorces, child custody, child support. I don't care what kind of court. They cannot have personal jurisdiction unless you first took an oath to perform the functions of public office to then be dragged into a public office known as an administrative court and then be coerced to perform in that administrative court. Commercially, under contract, in breach of trust in all matters where some dumb idiot claims to have personal jurisdiction when he can't possibly have it unless I privately signed it to him with a wet ink signature. Otherwise, that personal jurisdiction can never be anything more than presumed. Period. My yay is my yay. My nay is my nay. And like I said, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. You are mine. And he put me on this earth with no pen in my hand, but rather a mouth to speak his word. I don't... I'm far beyond the stamp on autograph and all that now, folks. 
You can put all that stuff in front of me. I'm going to go to the scripture every time. They never used a stamp in the scripture. There are a lot of things they didn't use in the scripture. And the scripture itself says, Thou shalt not add unto or take away from the word of God, lest ye be found a liar. Pure and simple. Right there tells you, if you really want your remedy, go to the scripture. That's the truth. In the beginning of his word, the word was God, the word was God. In the beginning of the word was magic, and the word was with magic, and the word was magic. How do you spell your words? Do you spell them with your actions? One USC one tells us words denoting numbers, gender, and so forth. Where does it talk in the Bible about numbers? Only in regards to the beast. Or that seven day or seven year period where we're to pay Sabbath. Pay Sabbath. Owe no man anything because you already prove in, on, and for the record by your actions that you pay Sabbath. I don't need to go to church on a Saturday and then commit sins the other six days of the week so I can go back and meet up with those same people doing the exact same thing. Titus 3.8 Do the good works and the, you do your good works through your hands. These hands can do glorious things and they can do glorious things just by pointing. No matter how anybody wants to say it's disrespectful. So when you point them out to their doctrines of law and their idiotic babbling for tax purposes... The motor vehicle operating lease is defined under tax code. And therefore, in order to have a motor vehicle operator's lease, you have to have an oath of office to enforce federal taxes, which aren't enforceable, particularly if they're under a contract, because they're non-taxable to begin with. So who are these idiots in office? And who the hell is voting for them? And why is it they think they're so much smarter than what I just put out here? This destroys the entire Congress. Congress shall lay and collect taxes and duties. Congress shall establish the post office. The post office, the postmaster general, regulates the entire judicial system and is operated under the Swiss franc, under the Constitution of the Universal Postal Union and the Treaty of Bern. So tell me about this dollar symbol now and your international organization standards. How much does your oath apply to that? Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness gracious. You took an oath to the Constitution of the United States and didn't even know that it itself was subject to the Constitution of the Universal Postal Union? You idiot. You are incompetent. Get out of office now. And I'm sorry it feels like I'm angry at these people that are acting like idiots stepping up in office, but it's not just them. I'm talking about everybody that Trump told you you are committing treason by voting. You're putting people in office that are just as incompetent as yourself and then expecting that because there's a democracy and 51% voted for a greater majority vote that the other 49 are controlled. Fuck you! Excuse my language. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. If you were to take it against my father, but it's not against my father, it's against those that lie. Whether it be through incompetence or intent. So again, I'm not going to do this video again. 
If you guys don't understand that no certificate is valid unless you are the one that certifies it. You are the one that certifies anything and it has to be certified not just by a signature but by your handwritten statement. When those people take an oath of office, that is an instrument by a government and they must certify it themselves by giving an handwritten statement as to the effect of their intent to that oath and then they must separately sign it in wet ink. It must be a separate document. Just like a promissory note attached to the contract, it must then be attached. If that oath of office doesn't come with the statement attached, I don't care where it's recorded or who says it has what authority, it is not certifiable. It has been conducted in fraud for the fact that it is deficient. And that deficiency proves their incompetence in honor for the record. So why would you let them to turn around and make it up and say, okay, well, here I changed my intent all of a sudden. Even though I never knew my intent before, I'm going to keep practicing commercially because that's the only thing I know. See, equity delights in equality and not by halves. And in order to receive equity, you must first bring equity. So if you don't know equity to begin with, how do you expect that all of a sudden somebody pointing one of your mistakes out and you correct that one mistake, all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, you know equity. You ain't operated in equity one day in your life. You can't possibly learn it in one instant. It's like riding a bike. You have to do it over and over again. And the more you do it, the harder it gets. Because again, yes, it sounds like I'm angry at these public officials and I'm angry at these people voting and allowing this stuff. But it's the anger of the not knowing. I'm putting it out there. It's plain writing. And it's very simple to follow. You can't. This is so plain. In such a short little period. And people want to write up pages and pages and pages and pages of documents. When all you got to do is use one reasonable logical point And government instrumentalities are not taxable. That means if you have to assess a tax. You are trying to implement a government. And by implementing a tax and saying well we have to assess the taxes. Before you can perform a contract commercially. That means that contracts are government instrumentalities. I am not required to contract to do a damn thing in life. And just so you know it, folks, even if I were, contracts by doctrine themselves, by reason and logic and operation, you don't have to write it down in a contract. Just like I said, you don't have to write the contract itself down. It does not require anybody to write in a contract without recourse. Contracts automatically come without recourse, like I said, by the operation. A contract must contain certain elements. Those elements prevent the supposed detriment that's supposed to not be included. It's called automatic estoppel. Once you realize there's something wrong, once you realize there's something in error, you're supposed to stop and correct the record. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I ran across a couple comments here real quick while I was reading through. Ship and dry dock. Okay, this is the way Admiralty Maritime works. Admiralty is the law of the sea, right? In order for them to wear, uh, uh, press their wares across the land, they have to have some kind of um, agreement to be able to come in to sell their wares. And like I said, in transportation, they require insurance. So they use what's known as inland marine insurance and what they do is everything's in dry dock as soon as you're born that's a dry dock instrument and you're required to turn around and get a social security or told to, that you can't get a job or driver's license without a social security security number so you go get a social security number when you fit when you're 18 years old or start working at age whatever state you're 
uh, age your state allows to start working, you go get a Social Security number. That Social Security is Inland Marine Insurance. The post office that the birth certificate goes through, those are warrant officers. They have secret security clearance for passing of such security instruments through those mail systems. They're warrant officers located at marine stations. Every post office is an inland marine station, and they have warrant officers. And the employees are staff members. Very concise in English in the, in the documents I put out. And if you guys ever have any questions as to any of this, please ask me and I'll, I'll, I'll source that stuff. Um, as I have many times. There's a circular that went out to the Postal Service from Marine Corps uh, headquarters stating this. They have to have a secret security clearance and that the post offices are Marine stations staffed by warrant officers that are required to have secret security clearance. So, anyway, um, yes, most definitely, I'm going to smoke one for everybody. I do as much as I can. Again, there is no law on this. Freely given what was given freely. And when he gives it to us, it's defined by our use, not by how somebody else wants to use it. So I use it as a, as a holy sacrament, a blessed sacrament. I don't, even, I don't even keep it and limit it to this source or this, this form. I use oils and additives too. Yeah, it's just like the, the fuel that I make. When people call me a moonshiner, yeah, I can drink it as moonshine. I can also use it as fuel in the, in the little uh, two-cylinder motors and stuff. I can use it as a lighter fluid. I can use it as, as an incense. Put, put a little bit of, mix it with a little bit of honey and some flower petals or maybe an apple and some cinnamon and put a candle underneath it and let it, let it burn off. And then the, the sticky stuff that's left, I can use it as a cough syrup. See, a thing is defined by its use and you can change its use in the middle of things. Or you can use one item for many kinds of things and therefore the definition constantly changes as it's in motion. This is my contract with life that's already inherent. It's in motion already. How dare you uh, violate and interfere with my commerce? <coughs> See, he's the one that gave us the immovable immutable oath that he shewed unto, unto Abraham, the same one he gave to us, that we too would be children of his kingdom so long as we just follow his word. That's all it takes. So learn the scriptures, find out what they mean, realize that all of their laws actually do tell you it's a matter of peace. So just write the state when you go to that car lot and you get that card. You write the state and you let the, the, the car lot know that you're going to be issuing that statement. And because they're the ones that are going to want to take that registration and, and go title it. And you're going to prevent that. No, it's not getting registered. It's not meant to be pledged. I'm not purchasing it for resales or import or export. I'm, I'm acquiring it <laughs> for private use. So think about this stuff and realize, people, I'm not putting up with it anymore. I quit signing shit six years ago because I realized certain elements, and one of the basic elements is you keep signing shit that you shouldn't be. In my research, I found out the one element is that you have to first take an oath to office in order to perform anything in their system, period. Even to go up and buy a stamp. You have to be performing the functions of public office, and that stamp is relation, or, or the, the use of that stamp in their internal operations already has a number that somebody can use instead of having to buy that stamp. 
You can already implement it because it's already been implemented and it bypasses everything along the way. It goes from the bottom jurisdiction all the way straight to the top just by using that number. You clarify the obligor. You clarify the exemption number. You clarify they are, they are identified by numbers and not by a name. Again, you won USC 1. Words denoting numbers, gender, and so forth. Why isn't words denoting words? Why isn't words defining ter words? Why isn't words defining terms and conditions? Why do they specifically say numbers and gender and so forth? Postal system does the same thing. Postal system in their post terms says the key. For the definition of key, it says to press numbered keys or other identifiers. Oh, guess what? Title 19 of the Code of Federal Regulations uh, 149.3 does the same thing in defining data elements. So when you think you're pressing those keys on the keyboard, known as data elements, the letter A is a data element, the letter E is a data element, the hyphen is a data element, they're all data elements, right? So under 19 CFR 149.3, it says data elements, and it says the shipper, the buyer, the importer of record, um, uh, the ship to party, um, various different people can use a number in lieu of the name and address. So why is it these officers are asking for all three? What's your name, number, and address? Rank, serial, and, and, and social security number. Rank, serial, and service number. Name, name, rank, and serial number. That's it. For military, they ask the same thing alongside the road. Name, rank, and serial number. Can I see your ID, please? That, that ID? That's the rank. That's the security clearance. That's the secret security clearance. They want to know what rank. And the lower rank you give them, the more they're going to abuse you. If you figure out how to give them the information without giving them what they're looking for, they know they can't look you up. Or they already look you up and they know they can't use the information. When an officer asks me for my name, sorry, I don't have a name. Well, everybody's got a name. No, nobody's have name. No bodies have names. It's their persons that have names. Real men have callings. Now, I've been called Keith all my life. And when mom and dad might get real mad at me, they might call me Keith Orland. Now, I hail from the family little, and I hear I was born around August 20th. Now, if that dumbass officer wants to put down a first, middle, and last name and a birth date, he's the one that's lying because I never gave him such data elements. And I specifically told him I don't have a name. And I know the difference between the day I was supposedly born on and the day of the birth date. Birth date. Date. Day and time executed. Well, if it's got a date then somebody executed it, and that means it goes against what was already executed. The thing that hath been done is what ought be done. There is nothing new under the sun, so why do we need all of these dates? Oh, well, that was to record the time of event. Well, that, why don't you put the time? Well, we need the date. Well, why don't you put the time and the day? They call it a date for a reason. It's an acronym. And everybody writes it capital D, A, lowercase A, lowercase T, lowercase E. You've been fooled. So anyway, everything's in peace, just like I showed you in that um, motor vehicle operator's lease. Just come to peace with yourself and show them the piece of the truth that's missing that means that you can't qualify for it. I can't qualify for a driver's license. I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. Unless you can find an oath of office and show that I'm qualified as a felon to fill the functions of a public office, then go ahead. But you already clarified me as a felon right there in and on and for your record. I think that's kind of inconsistent to turn around and then say I'm required to have a driver's license. You babbling idiots. And it's plain writing, concise English, Reason and logic. Come out of the fear, and you can use that reason and logic. You can start comprehending the, the concise English in plain writing. Only you can do it, though. So in the meantime, remember, folks, if it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't be doing this. I'm going to post all my links. I'm going to post my PayPal link. Please hit the, hit the share button and, and share some love. 
um, whatever method you're doing. If I, I certainly need the PayPal, but the world needs the most thing is the information. So make sure you hit the uh, the links and the information and share it all. And remember again, God bless you. If it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't be doing this. I already know this in my heart. All I got to do is let them know verbatim when I have interactions. You, people keep asking for documents. I don't have them. Look on my site. You got. You, I'm going to post my Word Wise Warrior site. Um, it's all there, and I can ad adopt and implement anything I want, anytime I need to, just by knowledge. It's all you guys need to do is quit signing that shit, gain the knowledge, and only sign as long as you are the one certifying the Word of God in that document. Without the Word of God, they can't move. He's the one that creates all things. He's the one that... That gives us this life force to move. So think about it and remember again. I love you.